Welcome to Grow Money Business, the podcast dedicated to helping business owners optimize income, pay less in tax, and invest prudently. Here's your host, Grant Bledsoe. Hello, everybody. Grant Bledsoe here. Welcome back to Grow Money Business. This week on the show, we're talking all about how and when to get out of an annuity policy. Annuity policies are relatively popular ways to guarantee income in retirement. You might be aware that I'm not a terribly large fan of them because they tend to be expensive and complex in ways that benefit the insurance companies that produce these things, the reps that sell them, but not very good for investors like you and me. So we talk about why that is in this week's episode. We also talk about the circumstances where it might make sense to use one, where it might make sense to hang on to one that you already own, and where it might make sense to dump one that you already own, as well as how to do that if that's the position you're in. I hope you enjoy it. Hey, everyone. I need to interject quickly to remind you all that nothing found in today's episode or any other episode of Grow Money Business should be considered financial, investing, legal, tax, fitness, or even relationship advice. It's content that you're free to use and to deploy on your own terms. And before taking any actions on content found on the show, please do consult with your tax professional, your attorney, or your financial planner. If you don't have a financial planner, head on over to threeoakswealth.com to learn more about what we do in terms of financial planning and investments and how we help clients on an ongoing basis. All righty. So last week on the show, we covered uh, some recent listener questions that have accumulated in the inbox for several for, for more than several months. There's actually a bunch of them still sitting there. But we had a, <clears throat> a really good question from uh, one of our listeners about whether it's time to reconsider annuities, given that interest rates are at a higher level today than they have been in quite some time, given the inflationary environment and the Federal Reserve's response to that. And we've talked a lot about uh, on the show about the inverted yield curve and, and all of the above. And as you may be aware, <clears throat> an annuity is an insurance product. You give money to an insurance company. They give you a monthly check every month for the rest of your life from either that point forward or some point in the future. And in general, <clears throat> the amount of that monthly check that you get in return depends on the level of interest rates. Because when you, you turn that money into guaranteed income through an annuity, the insurance company is simply pooling the risk that you uh, live to be 110 which is the risk to the insurance company, because if you live to be 110, then they have to cut you a whole bunch more checks than if you live to be 75, right? That's their longevity risk is what the insurance company is bearing. So when you, <clears throat> when you convert it, uh, when you convert your dollars into an annuity, in, um, and, and again, exchanging dollars now for guaranteed future monthly income, the insurance company is taking that money, pooling that longevity risk together with a whole bunch of other policyholders, and then taking your, your deposits, your premiums, and putting those in a variety of bonds to manage their, their risks, right? So this was a really good question we had last week. What I'd like to cover on the show today is when you know whether to hang on to an annuity that you might already have, what are some of the triggers that you might, uh, where you might want to consider dumping that annuity policy? We've had a lot of people come into the office over the last couple of years who just have these annuities they bought, you know, years and years ago, they haven't really looked at them. Well, how do you know whether it's a good idea to keep them or not? So we're going to cover that on the show today. I'll, I'll give everyone a quick primer of what annuities are in the first, pay, first place and what uh, uh, some of the different types are. But if you're someone out there who has an existing policy and you're not sure what to do with it, this might be a helpful episode for you to listen to because I'll cover pros and cons and the variables you might want to consider. We'll also circle back to how to do it. If you're in a position where you have an annuity policy that you don't want anymore, you confirmed that, that it's not a good fit for your needs, well, what do you do with it? How do you get rid of it? What are the tax implications? We'll cover all that on the, on the show today as well. So just to get us started, <clears throat> we should do a quick primer on what annuities are, what some of the different types are, and why uh, here in the office we're generally not a fan of using them. So the basic premise here, as I mentioned, is you give money to an insurance company, they issue you an annuity policy with a contract number, you sign on the dotted line, you give the insurance company money. You might never give money to the insurance company again. It might be a one-time single premium kind of deal where you only make one payment into the policy. 
you might continue putting more money into the policy in the future. There are, there are a lot of options with regard to how, how this is drawn up. You give the insurance company money at first, they draw up the policy. Then the balances in that policy grow or fluctuate over time based on how the policy is drawn up. And then at some future point, you, uh, you will either decide to annuitize the policy and exchange the value of that policy for uh, a guaranteed monthly income benefit, a check every month from the insurance company, or you might just start taking the money out of the policy when and how you need to without formally annuitizing it and guaranteeing that, that monthly check. So there are a lot of ways to, to draw these things up. The most basic form is called a single premium um, immediate annuity. What that means is you give money to the insurance company, they give you a check back every month for the rest of your life. It could be the rest of your life. It could be the rest of you and your combined, uh, you and your spouse's lives combined. So whoever lives later, it could be for 10 years and 10 years only or 20 years and 20 years only, maybe you and a beneficiary. There are very, there are a whole lot of options you have when drawing these things. And in general, what we need to remember is that insurance companies offer these customizations. They can be helpful for a lot of people, but they charge you for it in ways that are often unclear and difficult to understand. So you might say, well, I want to give money to an insurance company and then have them write me a check every month for the rest of me and my spouse's lives. Well, that's great. But the the insurance company is going to want to know the age and health of your spouse. If your spouse is 20 years younger than you are, then they may be willing to write your household a check until you both are gone but it's going to be substantially less than if they were writing just you a check for the rest of your life because you're 20 years older, right? So they, they take all these factors into account. And in general, they really take their pound of flesh when converting your money into guaranteed future incomes. So single premium immediate annuity is, is one kind. Another, another kind is a deferred income annuity. You give uh, money to the insurance company. The money goes into the policy. It grows at a, um, a rate of interest, like bank deposits, kind of like a CD. The value grows based on the rate of that deposit. And then at some point in the future, after the balances have grown at that interest rate for a period of time, then you annuitize it and convert it into income. Another is, is kind of a combination of the two, uh, a MIGA or multi-year uh, guaranteed annuity, where it might be a, a fixed interest rate for a couple of years, and then it floats after that. Uh, and then you you have all sorts of other types too. Variable annuities are uh, uh, similar to or more traditional investments. You take out an, an, an annuity, excuse me, annuity policy with the insurance company. You put money into the policy. Then you choose investment options to invest in within that policy. They're called sub accounts, and they're basically like mutual funds. So the value of these mutual funds goes up and down based on how the market does. And then at some point in the future, you can either choose to take money out of the policy uh, as income, or you can lock, you can annuitize and lock in the value uh, um, uh, as a, a form of guaranteed monthly income. So that's an opportunity where you put money into the policy, it grows. And uh, then at some point in the future, you turn it into guaranteed future income and, it, and you get to use the benefit of long-term market performance. What's really popular these days are uh, index-linked annuities to where it's not necessarily a direct investment in the stock market. You put money into the policy, they will give you some kind of value benefit. So if you put $100,000 into the policy, they will link the return on that cash to what the broader markets do. So it might be it might be uh, an index linked annuity linked to the S and P five hundred, and if the S and P five hundred goes up by seven percent, they'll give you a seven percent return on the funds within the policy. I have a lot of issues with this because they have all sorts of haircuts and caps on the gains, and they are attractive to people. and, and The old sales tactic is goes something like, "Well, how would you like to?" Uh, earn all the upside of the market without taking any of the downside, because if they give you, 
you know, 7% returns on the upside, they'll promise not to reduce the value in the years where the market crashes, which is attractive to a lot of people. But they take so many fees out of that balance along the way and they cap your gain. So in the, in the years where the market might go up 20 or 25%, they're only going to increase the value of your policy by a maximum of 10 uh, is, is one example of how this works. Long story short, there are a whole bunch of different types of policies. This is something that people approaching retirement are often interested in. And oftentimes people put money into these things along the way during their working years without any real plans for using them in the future. They just think they seem like a good deal. So those are the, the, the main types of policies that we see. There are a lot of costs and a lot of expenses related to these things. And on top of that, I'll add that there are very substantial commissions that go to insurance representatives who sell these things. And the amount of commission that you get for selling one depends on how profitable the product is to the insurance company. And to break down what that is, you remember the first form of annuity we covered here, a single premium immediate annuity, you give money to the insurance company, they give you a guaranteed check for every month for the rest of your life, very plain vanilla, not as complex, not as much space in a complex, not, not as much opportunity for the insurance company to ding you in areas that are difficult to understand. And so if an insurance representative sells one of these things, they get a commission of between 1% and 3% of the amount that goes into the policy. Same thing for a multi-year guaranteed annuity. Uh, deferred income annuities are just slightly more complex, but still relatively basic. The uh, commissions for those range from 2 to 4% of the amount going into the policy. If you put $100,000 in into a deferred income annuity, that means the rep who sold it is going to collect somewhere between two and $4,000 for selling it to you. Now, the other types, variable annuities, for a long time, these things were sold with like a 10% commission. These days, it's a little less than that. I think it's between 6 and 8%, I want to say. And for, for index-linked annuities, it is also between 6 and 8%. So what does that tell you? It tells you that these products are more profitable to the insurance companies because they're willing to pay salespeople more dollars for placing them in the hands of investors like you and me. And you might say, well, how can, how can a financial representative do this uh, legally? How can they sell these things in circumstances where it might not be a good fit for, uh, f uh, for their client? Well, insurance representatives have different sets of rules and regulations than investment and financial people do. So for example, our, our firm, we're registered. We are a registered investment advisory firm, which means that we have a fiduciary obligation to all our clients all the time. We don't sell insurance by design because we want to be held to that standard. There are a lot of people out there that are affiliated with brokerage firms. They have a Series 7 and a 63, and they also sell insurance as part of their, their service model. And that, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, they just collect a commission for selling the insurance part of it. And uh, sometimes that, that creates a conflict between delivering advice that's truly in your best interest and trying to get you to buy something that's going to um, pay them a, a larger commission. So th the commission is, is, is telling. It's, it tells us that in general, the more complex products are better for the insurance company and not as good for you and me. There are a number of other expenses on top of that. There's an administrative fee. So I'll use the example here of, let's, let's say you put $100,000 into um, a variable annuity. There's an administrative fee, which is going to be taken out of this kind of annuity and, and any others. Uh, that could be up to 0.3% of the policy value every single year. There are invest there are expenses of the underlying investments. So again, if you put $100,000 into the variable annuity, you choose which investments that $100,000 is placed in. It'll take a little bit off the top of your balance every single year for the administrative charge and some others that I'll I'll list off here in a second. And then the investments themselves, which again are like mutual funds, have an underlying cost. And in general, the subaccounts available within a variable annuity are a heck of a lot more expensive 
than mutual funds you might buy through your brokerage account at Fidelity or Schwab or Vanguard or somewhere like that. Um, generally, they're uh, they're expensive. They're um, they're usually under two and a half percent per year. Two and a half percent per year is re is way up there. That's really really high. Uh, most you know mega cap mutual funds you can get uh, mega cap U.S. stock funds. Uh, you can get for very, very low cost, especially if you're investing in an in index, uh, an index fund that is. Variable annuities do often contain index funds, but they're not going to be your Vanguard funds that are offered for 0.04%. They're probably going to charge you, you know, 0.75% or closer to 1%, um, although not as high as the, the 2% limit that I've just mentioned. Now, on top of that, these policies, remember, have some form of guaranteed income uh, in uh, within them. They have death benefits sometimes. They're an insurance product. And so there's a mortality uh, and expense fee that ranges from about a half a percent of policy value each year to upwards of 2%. And beyond that, you, know, you might have specific riders on your policy that will uh, uh, require an annual fee um, within... The index linked annuities, I mentioned the gain uh, caps and haircuts. So if, if, if it's an annuity linked to the performance of the S&P 500, they might not reduce your value in years where the index goes down, but you are losing a whole lot of upside in the years where the index grows by more than 10%. Some of them do have a slightly higher cap. I want to say they'll go up to maybe 12%, but uh, it, it's, it's just a huge haircut of returns. And others will, will haircut your returns where they'll only give you 90% of the index's performance. So if the markets go up by 10%, they'll increase the value of your policy by nine. So that's a whole bunch of different layers of fees. And it can be confusing trying to get to the bottom of them and understand exactly what's going on within the policy. There are also surrender charges in many of these policies, meaning when you put money into one of them, they might have a 10% surrender charge in the first year. And usually they those surrender charges will go down a little bit every year for the next five or 10 years. And the reason for that is, remember the, the amount of commission they're paying out to representatives. If you're going to pay an insurance representative 8% in, in the form of a commission for selling one of these policies, you are doing that because the policy is going to be profitable for the insurance company for a long time. And so you don't want to allow people who purchase these policies to surrender them and just get out of them the following year after you've ponied up 8% of the value to the rep who sold it. That's, that's a losing proposition. So they will incur surrender charges to prevent people from leaving. And if they do leave, they'll be able to um, replenish some of that money that went out to the salesperson in the first place. So this is really important if you have an old policy you think you might not need anymore. Number one, you have to understand what the surrender charges are. Uh, I ha there are a lot of policies out there that don't have them because they are um, maybe a little leaner in terms of the, the fee load. And, and, and these days there are uh, much better structured annuity policies out there because people understand this is a huge drag on returns. They can be terribly costly historically. And insurance companies got wise to that. And, and now there are a lot better options available. So all this to say, in general, you know, we when you face the, the decision of how you're going to produce income in retirement, you have a choice. You, you have a whole bunch of savings. Hopefully you have savings in retirement accounts, maybe some cash in the bank, or other investment accounts. When you stop working, you have to turn that nest egg into income in retirement. And one option is to take that nest egg and fork it over to an insurance company and have them send you a check every month. That is certainly a viable option. And as long as that insurance company exists, they have a legal obligation to keep sending you the check. I would argue that if you have a sufficient nest egg, you are most people are far better off bearing the investment risk themselves, investing that nest egg, and taking some money out of the portfolio every single month to pay their living expenses. Because between all those fees that we just went over, 
and the commissions paid to representatives for selling the policies and the surrender charges involved if you want to get out of one, insurance companies really take, and that's what I mean when I say they take their pound of flesh when you convert your nest egg into guaranteed future income. And because of that huge layer of fees, you're almost always better off, in my opinion, bearing some investment risk yourself, creating income out of your own portfolio by investing it and then taking some withdrawals. Now, if you do that, instead of buying the annuity and you uh, and the market crashes immediately after, then that's a that's a problem. That's that's part of the risk that you take when, when when you create your own guaranteed income. I just have a hard time giving up so much of your hard earned dollars to an insurance company in, in exchange for that guarantee. And on top of that, once you fork over the cash to the insurance company, you're giving up a huge degree of control. You know these these things are usually structured where after you die. The monthly income shuts off. The insurance company stops paying you, stops paying your estate. And any money that was left over, the insurance company keeps. That's the deal. You give them money. They give you a check every month for the rest of your life. No more, no less. Again, yeah, some policies can include a death benefit or send some money to the beneficiaries, whatever's left over. There are ways to structure it, yes. But that's usually not how it works. And even if it is how it works, once you put the cash in the insurance policy, you have far less control over it compared to if it's sitting in a 401k or a taxable account or an IRA. Now compare that if you do your if if you're bearing the investment risk, you're turning your savings and your portfolio into get into uh, retirement income. Whatever's left over after you die goes to your beneficiaries either the ones you list on the account or the ones you list in your will or in your trust, they inherit whatever's left over. And in in most annuity policies, it just evaporates. So there's multi-generational benefits here too. So here's here's some circumstances where we'd want to really think hard about getting rid of an annuity that you have. And, And again, the classic case here is you put some money into these things. You're you're not really sure what you're getting yourself into. Maybe you're not sure whether this complements your your retirement plan now or not. If you're in a situation where you have one of these things, you're not really sure. Number one, make sure you have your head wrapped around what your retirement income plan is going to look like. And an annuity policy could certainly be a part of that. But if you have one and it doesn't fit your plans then that's a pretty good reason to look at getting out of it. And some other barometers that I'd look at are what's the size of your nest egg relative to how much income you want to take out? So what's your withdrawal rate? Uh, How much do you want to leave for people after you pass? What are your other sources of guaranteed income? So if you don't have any guaranteed income at all, you're not eligible for social security or pension or anything like that, and you have $1 million saved up for retirement and you want to take $100,000 a year out of that portfolio to, to pay your living expenses, you're at a very high risk of running out of money. And that might be a circumstance where you want to hang on to that annuity policy if it's a reasonable fit for the rest of your plan. Because if the annuity policy provides some income, that means that you don't have to take quite $100,000 out every year. You can take less than that, which will preserve the, the portfolio for longer. So I would look at the rest of your financial planning and uh, determine whether or not that policy is a good fit for the other parts of it. Another reason you might want to get out of it is you simply want control over that money. Maybe you bought uh, the annuity policy years ago. You have other plans for it. You just want control. You want to be able to bequeath that cash or that investment to your beneficiaries after you go. That's a good reason to think about getting rid of it. The surrender charges may have expired. That's a good reason to think about getting getting rid of it if it doesn't fit your plans. And most importantly, the, the costs. The, the costs in these old policies are usually very, very high. Um, if I it, Once you add up all the costs on an annualized basis, if it's costing you more than one and a half or 2%, after you sum the administrative fees, the investment expenses, the uh, mortality and exp- uh, uh, mortality and rider charges, if it's more than one and a half or two percent a year, then 
I would think hard about getting out of that policy. Um, that doesn't mean that you have to take the cash out and just not have any annuity at all. It means that there are more efficient and less expensive annuities on the market today that you might want to think about swapping into, particularly if the surrender charge period is behind you and you can get that cash out without paying that expense whatsoever. Now, it's harder to total up how much you're paying in annual expenses in the index linked annuity that I mentioned earlier, because they'll use the, the, the insurance companies and salespeople will use terms like, well, there are no expenses. We just cap the, the returns. And that makes it very hard to determine what their ac- what the expenses actually are. Um, so it's a little bit murkier for, for index linked annuities, but just be aware that behind the scenes, remember the commissions on those products are super high which tells me that it's good for the insurance companies and not as good for you. Now, some circumstances where you want to hang on to these things, if you're not sure whether what you have is a good fit for your financial plan and your retirement income plan, don't just get rid of this thing frivolously because there might be tax ramifications that we'll talk about here in a minute. You want to have an understanding of what your plan is going to look like and whether what you have complements it or not. That's first and foremost, right? If you're if if you're relying on that now, let's say that you get to the point where you have the plan in place and the annuity is part of that plan, to where you're going to rely on the income produced from that policy for um, uh, to pay your expenses in retirement, then obviously don't get rid of it. The whole key is you have to have the plan in place first to to understand whether it's congruent and aligned with what you're trying to accomplish or, or not. Uh, even if you're not sure. Take a look at the fees. If it's not too expensive, if it's less than you know the one and a half, two percent a year mark, compare. It sounds high, sounds like a, a very substantial fee, but uh, realistically, in the landscape of these policies, that's that's kind of middle of the ground. And um, there might be less expensive options out there, but uh, uh, that's just kind of how these things work these days. On top of that, if you're still in the surrender period, it's hard to justify walking away and paying that surrender charge. So let's let's use an example. Let's say that the surrender charge in the first year is 5% and it goes down by 1% every year until it expires and goes to, to and, and the surrender charge goes away. That means that if you put $100,000 into this policy and then nine months down the road, you want the $100,000 back, you can surrender the policy and get your cash back, but they will keep 5% of it or $5,000 you'll get to cash out the other 95000 aside from market performance and other factors that might impact the value. If you wait one year, the surrender charge goes down from 5% to 4%. Now you get to keep an extra $1,000 if you walk away. So if, if you're uh, unsure about a, an, a policy that you have, but you're still in that surrender period, don't get rid of the thing yet. Make sure you understand the benefit of it, whether it's congruent with your planning, and then perhaps wait until the surrender period is over before you walk away. Um, if you don't need to control the cash, or if you don't really need the multi-generational financial planning benefits of these things, meaning that if you don't have beneficiaries that you care to leave any money to, then you might not need that element of control we talked about earlier. The benefit of investing it on your own for a lot of people is that once you die, you get to give whatever's left over to whomever you want. But if that's not important to you, then yeah, maybe it makes sense to hang on to that policy or even you know, explore a new one for your retirement plan. And the last thing I'll add um, to all this in, in terms of circumstances of when it makes sense to hang on to the, to, onto the annuity policy is if you have already annuitized, generally you have locked yourself in. At that point, you you are guaranteed that monthly check for the rest of your life, and it is either not possible or not advisable to do anything differently. So remember the different forms here. You put money into the policy over time, the balance grows, and then at some point you have the choice of converting what's in the policy to the guaranteed check or maybe just taking a little bit of money out of the policy, but not annuitizing it. 
if you have annuitized it and already uh, are collecting that monthly check, you you pretty much locked yourself in. And I'm, I'm trying to remember the name of this um, organization. I think it's called. I think it's JG Wentworth. They have really catchy television commercials, if I recall. They're the people who will if if you're if if you've reached some sort of settlement and like an accident liability claim, like if if you're driving around on the road, somebody t bones you, and they're at fault, and there's some settlement where they have to pay you a certain number of dollars a month for the next ten years, they will purchase that future income stream and give you cash up front now. That's the kind of situation you're in if you have already annuitized, but you want to do something different with that guaranteed income. You have to have to go to a place that's going to you know, rip your face off in terms of what they offer you for that guaranteed future stream of income. They'll give you pennies on the dollar compared to what it's worth. But for a lot of people, that's attractive because they need cash in their hands now. Um, so that's, those are some circumstances that, that make sense to hang on to the policy. I, I think in general, the most important thing here is don't just buy an annuity to buy an annuity. Don't just hang on to an annuity to an annuity to hang on to it. There is so much benefit and opportunity in long-term financial planning and having a retirement income plan that aligns what you're trying to do, what your family is trying to do, what your values are, what your assets and resources look like. It just enables you to make sure everything is pointing in in the same direction, propelling each other toward whatever that destination looks like to you. And an annuity policy might be a really good complement to that, or it might be a really poor fit. The whole point is having an idea of what that looks like through your eyes and making a and making that conscious decision. And if you have a policy that is not a good fit, you're after the surrender charge. The thing is too expensive. You want to you want to take money out. You've not annuitized it yet. Then that makes sense to think about surrendering the policy. Don't do it before you've checked all those boxes. And I say that because you might walk away with less than your than, than you could have. There are tax ramifications for these things. So it, logistically, the way to surrender one of these things is pretty simple. You call the one eight hundred number on the statement for your annuity and tell them you want to surrender it. They'll send you some paperwork, you sign it, it may require a notary, and then you send it off to them and then they'll cut you a check maybe two to four weeks down the road. That part of it is pretty simple. The tax ramifications are a little more complex than that. What you need to do first is take a look on the statement from your, the most recent statement from the annuity, annuity policy and determine whether or not the annuity is qualified or not. And that means that you can purchase these things within an IRA. And sometimes on a statement, it'll, it'll be called a, uh, a section 408 trust, which I know is weird. It's a section of the tax code. If you see the, 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 um, the, le- the numbers 408 next to the type of annuity, that means it's inside an IRA. If it says the words qualified or IRA or anything like that, that also means that it's inside an IRA. What that means is that if you have $100,000 in this policy and you surrender it, you can take that cash and roll it into an IRA at any brokerage firm and keep the money and and use the cash to purchase investments. And it's a tax-free rollover. Since the cash was already inside an IRA when it was in the annuity policy, it's not a taxable event when you surrender it. It's only a taxable event when you take it out. So what you don't want to do then is if it's inside an IRA and you surrender it and the insurance company sends you a check, what you don't want to do is deposit that check in your bank account. What you do want to do is mail the check to your broker brokerage firm, tell them that it's a trustee to trustee rollover and deposit it to be invested. And if you don't have an IRA opened yet, then then it's easy to do online. So that's how to handle it. If, if it's in an IRA if it, or if it's a qualified annuity, that means that you can surrender it without paying tax because it's inside a tax deferred retirement account. Take the cash, go and go deposit that cash in a more investment-oriented uh, retirement account. 
Now, alternatively to that, alternate to that is a non-qualified annuity. That means that the money that you put into the policy is not within any kind of retirement account. If you put $100,000 in, it's just like any other investment. If you put $100,000 in, you take 110000 out. Now you have $10,000 that you need to pay tax on. And whether that's, to, that, whether that's capital gain or uh, taxes or income taxes depends on the structure. And I have to refresh my memory on the details on that. Just know that if you put money into one of these policies and then you take more money out than what you put in, that's going to result in taxes. So we've been using the, 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 the circumstance of you put $100,000 into one of these things. If you put $100,000 in, into a non-qualified annuity, then you surrender it and you get $90,000 out, then no tax implications. You have a $10,000 loss that you may or may not be able to deduct against the rest of your income. If it's $100,000 that you pull out, again, no taxes due. But if it's one ten, if it's any more than what you put in, that's going to result in taxes. And so what you do is compare the money that you get out of the policy when you surrender it to the total amount of dollars that have ever gone into the policy. So if you put $1,000 in every single month for 10 years, that means that your basis will be $120,000. And if you surrender the policy now, let's say that you get $150,000 out of it, well, that $30,000 difference is going to be taxable. And this is where exchanges might start, make to, might start making sense for you. So a lot of our real estate investors out there will be familiar with your 1031 exchange. You put money into an investment property, you depreciate the thing over time, you don't want to sell it and pay a whole bunch of capital gains taxes. So you sell it and you exchange it via section 1031 of the tax code to a different property and you kick that uh, realization of capital gains, the, the tax on the gains down the road. It's a really, really powerful strategy for real estate investors. Well, there is a similar section of the code that relates to insurance policies. It's called section 1035. So in that example, if, if you put $1,000 into a policy for 10 years, every single month, your basis is 120 grand. Then you surrender the thing for 150. If you don't want to pay tax on the 30,000 of gain, you can do what's called a 1035 exchange. Take the $150,000, put it directly into another insurance product, an annuity policy. You can do hybrid life insurance and long-term care policies, I believe. Uh, this is a quick Google search away, but th th there are some swaps between insurance contracts that are eligible for this and others that are not. So I'd, I'd look that up. And that enables you to get the full $150,000 into the new policy without paying tax on that 30 grand. So if you're looking at this thing in terms of you know, the, the policy that you have is a good fit for your retirement plan or, or maybe some kind of annuity policy is a good fit for your retirement plan, but you don't exactly like the policy you have because it's super expensive, this could be a good fit. You could swap the policy you have out for something less expensive and kick the realization of those taxable gains down the road into the future. And when you start taking money out of the policy, that's when some of the money coming out becomes taxable to you. And it's basically the ratio, it's called the exclusion ratio, by the way, the ratio of money that comes out to your basis or, or ratio of market value to basis is what you use to determine how much of each distribution is taxable. And that's true whether it's annuitized or uh, whether you just take take money out of the policies. So that's a it's a long-winded monologue on annuities. Uh, if you're in the position where you're you're saving for your future, you're not really sure whether annuity policies are a good fit. There are some features that sound kind of attractive, but you're not sure. In general, it's better to steer way clear of these things. Just keep putting money into your retirement accounts that you have full discretion over, that you're not ever going to lose control over. If you're approaching retirement and guaranteed income sounds really attractive, then the then this might start making sense if it's congruent with the rest of your retirement income planning. Interest rates are a little bit higher now, 
So you get a little bit more in terms of monthly check from the insurance company. That being said, it's still usually better to steer clear if you're comfortable with the investment risk, if you can uh, come up with a plan that suits your needs and that of the rest of your families. So that's it for today. I, I hope this was helpful. These things do come up fairly frequently, and uh, it's just helpful to know the details about when it makes sense to to hang on. When could it be a good fit for you? When might it not be a good fit for you? What are the expenses? How do you determine what they are? If you have one of these policies, they're re- the insurance companies are required to provide you with a prospectus. If you can't find it, call them and ask for one. They're required to send it to you. And that's where you can find what all these various expenses are. And again, look for administrative expenses, investment expenses, mortality and expense uh, fees, riders, caps on gains, surrender charges. There's just a litany of items and they can all be found in the prospectus. All right, that's it for today. Hope you enjoyed it and I'll talk to you again soon. Thanks for tuning in to Grow Money Business, the podcast dedicated to helping business owners optimize income, pay less in tax, and invest prudently. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Google, Spotify, or wherever you digest podcasts to ensure you don't miss out on future episodes and announcements. And feel free to submit questions to growmoneybusiness.com.